from there, we're going to go ahead and get started. So, we'll start with some introductions. So, myself, my name is Brittany Like. I am the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon. My name is Michelle Sarah. I am a student at Maine State University, and I work with Detroit Audubon in their Safe Passage program. I also monitor our resident peregrine falcon pair here at Wayne State's campus. Hi, I'm Ava Landgraf, the Detroit Audubon Research Coordinator, um, and I'm very excited to miss webinar. Thank you for joining. All right. So we're going to go ahead and continue. So all in all, our question is, what are urban birds as a start? So urban birds are species of bird that have adapted to living in areas with higher populations of humans. But uh, when it comes to that, what defines an area as urban? All in all, they are less natural areas with more people and more buildings. But uh, before we really discuss what birds you can find, you should keep in mind what the different range types are. And so that would include your resident, breeding, non-breeding, and migratory. And so say you're looking in a bird book at where some of these species of birds can be found, and that's what those range types are usually listed under. So we're mostly focusing on the resident, which are year round, and migratory, which are passing through in your spring and fall migrations. Um, but we will lightly touch on your breeding and non-breeding birds as well. So to the right here, you do also see some more common situations of what urban birds you would typically see in your areas, whether that's your rock doves, um, maybe if you have a bird feeder at your house or your apartment, or even just some ducks that have recently laid eggs somewhere nearby. So some challenges for urban birds. And so a multitude, multitude of challenges that urban birds face, the biggest problem being that they have increased competition, which then causes your higher rates of predation, fewer resources, and higher chances of disease being spread. So whenever you have larger populations, it's not uncommon for those diseases to spread more quickly, whether it's birds, trees, or even people. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we will address that a little bit later of how you can help reduce that problem a little bit. But outside of that, another major problem when it comes to urban birds is usually things related to humans, and that's cars, buildings, pollution, power lines, things like that, that you'd find in urban areas more so than you would in your rural locations. From here, we will delve into what birds you are likely to find in urban environments. Just to give you a sense of what this looks like from a bird's eye view, and for those of you who are joining us from outside of the Detroit metropolitan area, the picture on the top is um, Detroit. And you'll see it right there along the Detroit River. So if you're migrating north or south, or you're a resident bird looking for some green space to settle down in, you'll notice right here, there's not a whole lot. A lot of buildings, impervious surfaces, roads, pavement. But there are those delectable little spots where there is green space. So we do get quite a few birds in this area. And I'll talk about why in just a little while. For those of you who aren't familiar with or may be familiar with the Detroit skyline, you can see where we've got that density of taller buildings. Um, those are potential roosting places, but they're not good food places, not good water places, and can be very hazardous to birds because of the windows that they have. And in the lower right, you'll see a kind of more panned out view of the area where Lake St. Clair comes into the Detroit River. Detroit is right there across from Windsor. So welcome to those of you from Windsor. And you can see, again, if you were a bird, it doesn't look like a very enticing area, not a lot of green space. That's outside of the perimeter of the majority of the Detroit, Detroit metropolitan region. But we do have some great parks here in the city and in the surrounding communities. What we want to do is try and beef up our own yards, businesses, maybe where we work to make them more attractive and supportive of our urban birds.
So from here, we are going to be talking about some common species. And so we'll start with our common year round natives. So what we have listed here isn't necessarily all of what you're going to see, um, but it is more commonly seen species. And so some of those would include what most people would know of as your American Robin, your Cardinals, your Blue Jays, um, maybe even some mallard ducks or gulls, hawks, even maybe owls if you're lucky enough, but less likely to see owls unless you have uh, bigger trees, but it's more common species that you'd find year round or what some people would also call your residential birds. From there, you have your seasonal common natives. And so we mentioned earlier your breeding versus non-breeding birds. And so these are what uh, you would find. It's your breeding birds are your summer birds. So like your house wren, your blackbirds, some of those species that you would see um, in some of those areas only in the summertime because they would migrate north and south in the spring and summer or spring and fall. And so from there, you also have your non-breeding birds, which are your wintering birds. And so even though we have a lot of people that they might, people and birds migrate south to stay warm in the win, uh, winter time, we actually are the uh, southern, southern range for some of those species, such as the white-throated sparrow and the dark-eyed junco, who actually their breeding locations are up in Canada. And so we are south to them. Okay, so now we have our common non-native birds that we can find in urban areas. Um, so a non-native species is any species that is introduced to North America by people or after European settlement. Um, many of these species are either European or Asian. Um, some non-natives are considered invasive species. Um, so this means that they actually cause some harm to the native species or disrupt the ecosystem. Um, some of these really common ones that we see include the house sparrow, the European starling, our city pigeon, and the ring-necked pheasant. Um, I really like to emphasize that invasive birds are not bad birds. They're just trying to live and survive um, like any other living thing. Um, it just happens that they are very adaptive and opportunistic, and so they have done well in these environments and are out competing species. Um, kind of different from that is a non-native like the ring-necked pheasant that is not invasive. Um, it doesn't cause any issues in the ecosystem um, as far as we know, and it's actually just a fun bird to have around because it's so beautiful. Um, so, yeah. And then here in at least the Detroit metropolitan area, we have a few unique natives who make use of the structures that we have in urban areas. At Wayne State University and in several spots uh, around southeastern lower Michigan, we have nesting pairs of peregrine falcons, which may surprise a lot of people. But our tall buildings serve um, as perfect nesting sites in the wild they would normally use cliff faces. And they need to dive from those tall buildings in order to get their prey, which are other flying birds. So we see here a picture taken from Old Main, the iconic building on Wayne State's campus, where we have a nesting pair of peregrine falcons. And this was the day that we installed the webcam there. So you can actually watch our peregrine falcons. They were actually at the nest site at 444 this afternoon and will be laying eggs within the next month. So you can check that out later when we send you the link. Another bird that we see in urban areas that makes use of structures is the chimney swift. And according to its name, yes, it does use chimneys. In the wild, they would normally have used a hollowed out tree, but chimneys are a pretty good um, analogy to that. So we do see a lot of chimney swifts here in the city. As I mentioned earlier, we're an important migratory stopover site. A stopover is like a combination hotel restaurant for birds. So as they are migrating either north or south, they need to stop, refuel, rest. Um, and we are 
hot spot because two migratory flyways cross right in our area. The purple one on the right-hand side of the map is the Atlantic Flyway. And you'll see it kind of passing over Lake Huron. And there's that little branch that comes down right over Lake St. Clair along the Eastern part of the Lower Peninsula. The yellow one is the Mississippi Flyway, also comes through this region. So we get a lot of birds in this area during migratory season and they need those stopover habitats. As I put it, you can plant your backyard or your business or your industrial parkway to be McDonald's for birds. Now, all migrants are cool, but I do have a few personal favorites because I get them in my backyard, which is right across the street from Wayne State University. It's a very tiny backyard. I'm trying to naturalize it as much as possible to be attractive to birds. And these are some of the really cool birds that I have seen in my teeny tiny backyard here in Detroit. Part of that is because we have some big old trees here in the neighborhood still. So the Orioles come and hang out there, um, the mulberry tree right behind my house, which drops its fruit all over my car, is a great spot for the Orioles. We get hummingbirds in the area, lots of different warblers. I'm always surprised to see a common yellow throat almost every spring in my chain link fence. Even though you associate them with wetlands, they're here looking for insects. Um, oven birds in the leaf litter that I keep underneath the shrubs and plants in my garden beds, I just rake it right off the lawn and right into the garden bed so they can hunt around for insects in the leaf litter. Lots of sparrows do the same thing in that area as do the thrushes. So that's just some of the cool migrants I get to see. And I forgot one here that I'll just mention really quick. We get woodcocks on campus every spring and fall. And that's because campus actually has some really interesting green spaces that vary all the way from formal gardens around the president's house, which you see in the upper right-hand corner there, but it's got some big old trees, some nice large evergreens to serve as shelter. So we get quite a few birds in that area. And then in some other places on campus, we've been starting to naturalize a lot more, incorporating native plant species to attract insects, which serve as a large food source for a lot of birds. And in this particular space that you see in the lower part of the screen, that's our bioswale right off of Woodward Avenue in the middle of a large parking lot. And a couple summers ago, I was in there checking things out and I spooked a pheasant. We see goldfinches there all the time. So it's really starting to attract birds because of the insect populations that are increasing in that area. As I mentioned earlier, um, Old Main has a peregrine nest and roosting site for a pair of mated peregrine falcons. And then our biological sciences building has a little teeny woodland in the front and a little teeny grassland in the back. So two very different habitats because of the way um, the light and soils are in those areas. And we're hoping to have a couple bird walks on campus this spring. So we'll be talking about those a little later visiting our birding hotspots on campus. So we have uh, here, just we're gonna talk about some backyard bird feeder information. So all in all, the, one of the more important things to talk about is placement from windows. So depending on where you've looked up your information or who you've talked to, what they say can be a little different. All in all, so if you go to a Wild Birds Unlimited, they'll say less than three feet from a window, as well as more than eight to 10 feet away from a window. Some sites will say more than 30 feet is safe, while others will say only less than three feet from a window is safe. So it's up to you to decide what you're most comfortable with, but all in all, uh, everyone agrees that less than three feet is a good option for a bird feeder. Outside of that, something to consider is how far off the ground it is. So for some people, they're worried about uh, squirrels. And so the bottom right picture actually kind of is a good indicator for um, placement from squirrels. So that's on a tree, but ideally for a squirrel, um, they can jump up to about eight to 10 feet from a building or a tree. 
Um, they can jump up to five feet from the ground, but I have listed here more than six feet off the ground is the preferred option, not only because of squirrels, raccoons, and other problem species. The big issue is deer. So you want to have something that's at least about six feet off the ground because you don't want deer getting to your food. From there, we'll talk about bird safety. And so something to keep in mind is uh, when it comes to diseases as well as predators. So shrubs nearby, whether they're big or small, are always a good option when it comes to helping protect your birds from predators. Uh, you don't want it too close again because it can help with the squirrels a little bit, but all in all, you do want to have some shrubs nearby. Um, in regards to cleaning your figure feeders regularly, again, with larger populations of birds, you have increased chances of diseases. And so you do always want to clean your feeders regularly. Types of food is important to think about. And so you can buy food anywhere. Um, it is up to you what type of food you buy. I personally would recommend either no mess blends or shellless seed blends. And so, um, and there's multiple reasons why you'd want to consider that. And so the big thing- Booth cheeks hanging out. Oh, oh someone's unmuted. Um, but something that you'll want to consider with the no mess blends is one, it helps you because there's less you have to clean up. So it also helps with your grass. So if you get a lot of shells in your grass, it can kill it. So that's something that's beneficial for you. The other thing to consider is when you have shells, they get knocked onto the ground. If you have millet or ground feeding bird type food that gets on the ground, it attracts rodents, squirrels, rats and even your deer. So no, no mess blends are better, but some other options besides no mess ones are your thistle, your safflower, and even your suet. So all of those types of varieties are good options that really reduce how much mess you have, but are also good at avoiding species that you don't want coming to your feeders. Uh, moving into the hummingbird feeders. So with hummingbirds, just like any other bird species, you do want to always keep your feeders clean. Uh, hummingbirds are also very susceptible to diseases, and so it's important to keep your feeders clean as often as possible. Um, but another key thing to keep in mind with hummingbirds is I strongly encourage you to avoid purchasing red dyed food for the hummingbirds. I've heard that uh, it can be toxic to the hummingbirds. And so I do highly encourage you avoid purchasing the red dyed varieties. Um, usually it's just better to do a water sugar combination. So. so water sources. So most people don't actually realize that food is great for birds, um, but the best way to attract birds is with water. Uh, birds always need water just like we do, and so it's a really good option, but something to keep in mind with your, your bird baths is, and this is just something I prefer, is to avoid glass bird baths. So it's like when we walk on ice. You want to have something that has more grip, so concrete or textured birds, bird baths are a better option for the birds. They're more comfortable, they're more likely to stay longer, so you can see them. And so that's always a nice option um, moving into kind of the pollinators. So the thing with bird baths is pollinators and other things besides birds are gonna want water too. But with your pollinators, they're gonna drown if it's too deep. And so sometimes it helps to put in some rocks into your bird bath and that actually helps to eliminate the chances of the insects drowning in your water. And just with your bird baths you, or your bird feeders, your bird baths also need to be cleaned regularly. Chemicals can be really toxic to birds, so you want to avoid chemicals altogether, but um, you can use a scrub brush instead of chemicals to clean them. And then from there, uh, you'll also want to dump it out periodically just because that's where mosquitoes will lay their eggs. And so by dumping it out regularly, you'll one, increase the chances of it staying clean longer, but it'll reduce your mosquito population. So, the other big topic when it comes to backyard birding. So there's been a new city ordin ordinance put in place across the state that if you are found baiting deer, feeding them, even if it's not on purpose, it is considered a crime. That started, I think, last October. It was put in place across the state. And so 
I do strongly encourage you focus on that six feet off the ground for your bird feeders. Um, because if you are found caught feeding them, again, even if it's not on purpose, if deer are found eating out of your bird feeder, once it's a demeanor, three times or more, it's a felony. So please be careful. It's not that we don't want you to feed the birds, but do it carefully. And keep in mind that we just wanna keep you safe uh, and the birds and wildlife safe as well. But outside of that, the other thing to keep in mind is rats. Rats are a problem all over the place, but it is different based on what city you live in. So check in with your local ordinance about the rat issues and bird feeders, depending on where you live. Birdhouses. So everyone loves baby birds. It happens, it's fun, it's cool to see. But the thing to keep in mind for all birdhouses is the size of the hole does impact what birds you could be attracting to your birdhouses. If it's more than 1.75 inches in diameter, you are more than likely attracting house sparrows to your birdhouse. If it's less, you're more likely to get other those other birds that are listed on this uh, on this list. However, it's not uncommon for birds if it's a wood birdhouse for them to open it up the hole a little bit further so they can get in there. And so you can go to your local stores and sometimes they'll sell these metal coverings that ensure that the birds can't do that. Um, but all in all, this is a nice list for you to be able to refer to when you're deciding what birdhouse you may want to put in your yard. As Brittany's been talking about, we can provide habitat for birds through constructed or purchased items. We can also do that by planting things. And the best thing to do when you're planning either direction or incorporating everything that you can is to know your birds. A really good site for that is Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology, all about birds. There are two sections of this that will give you the information that you need. First of all, the range maps will tell you what birds to expect in your area and what time of year they're likely to be there. And then the live history pages will talk about what food adults and nests will need and what these birds use as shelters, either for nests or to keep away from weather and predators. So that will help you plan what you're going to do in your yard to support these urban birds. You can go ahead, Brittany, thanks. Um, now I'm gonna to touch on the natural aspects that you can use to incorporate in your yard, no matter how big or small. Some of these things you can even do on um, a condo patio or an apartment balcony. I'm going to start with woody plants because they do the best for supporting birds. Why, my all-time favorite is the service berry, just because it's a beautiful small understory tree that can tolerate a wide range of conditions. So it has white flowers in the spring, beautiful fall colors, but the birds are attracted to the berries that it produces in the summer. These are edible for us as well, but you won't get any. The birds are going to scarf them up long before you get to have yours. So that's one of my number one recommendations. For a small shrub that also produces berries, chokeberry will take a wide range of conditions as well. And it has beautiful fall foliage and white flowers in the summer. For trees, I have to have highly recommend oaks. As Doug Tallamy will tell you, and if you haven't heard of Doug Tallamy, look him up because he's a big proponent for birds. And we'll talk a little bit about one of his resources later. Oaks support the most variety of Lepidopteran larvae. In other words, caterpillars from moths and butterflies. And this is what most songbirds feed their babies and what they eat themselves as well. They're highly nutritious, but they have to have the proper plants to eat from. And oaks support the most in greatest abundance. And you're saying, but I have a small suburban yard or a small urban yard. I can't grow an oak tree. Well, there are oak trees that you can grow. Chinkapin oaks are relatively small, so are pin oaks, and they grow a little more quickly than some of the larger oak trees. So no matter your conditions, you could probably have an oak tree, except maybe a, an apartment balcony. That would be a little tough. Um, but you can encourage them as sidewalk um, trees as well and front yard trees. They have a very deep root system, so they don't pop up your sidewalk and your pavement like maple trees do. 
They provide a lot of shade for you. And they're great mast trees if you live in places where you have birds that will eat the acorns as well. Um, terrific for nest sites. So all around oaks are a great tree to have. As Brittany was talking about, and we mentioned earlier, shelter is very important. And this is shelter from weather, from predators, and also nesting locations. So evergreens are very important for that, um, not only in the winter, but year round. Spruces are one of my favorites because people like the look of them. I do recommend native spruces, not Norway spruces. So you can get white spruces. Another one that I don't have here is the white cedar or arborvitae. Um, as long as you don't trim them into all kinds of fantastical shapes, the birds will be happy to use them. Even if you can't have larger trees and shrubs, just about everybody can find a place for flowering plants like these. They provide pollen and nectar for insects that the birds can come and eat. Nectar, seeds, and fruit for a lot of our birds. So depending on the plant, they can provide these things for birds throughout the seasons. And you'll want to keep that in mind because these plants are blooming, producing seed, and going dormant at different times of the year. And you want to have this nice continuum for our resident birds. As they dry up, they can also provide nesting material and some of the seed heads do that as well. And here I've got five of my favorites. In the lower left is the Coreopsis. There are several species. They bloom at different times of the year and produce seed at different times of the year. Some of them are small enough to have in pots on your patio or balcony. Um, and the goldfinches go crazy for the seeds and will scatter the seeds everywhere. So you'll have little ones coming up where you didn't plant them. So be aware of that. Um, there are many varieties of coneflowers. The one pictured here is the gray-headed coneflower or prairie coneflower, another goldfinch favorite. And above that, a native sunflower. You can find non-native varieties of the Coreopsis sunflower and coneflowers as well. I would recommend highly natives if you can. Um, in the place where you live, just because they will help to support your birds better. They're co-evolved with the birds, so their nutrient levels are higher and the birds understand the timing and the seed production on these plants better than non-natives. In the fall, asters and goldenrods will attract a lot of insects, which will provide food for migratory birds. And the asters, even though they have very tiny seeds, those seeds are eaten by juncos in the winter. So that brings up another important point, and that's leaving these plants, their seed heads and their stems up through the winter. The seeds will provide forage for birds, the stems and leaves hiding places for insects, which the birds will also eat, and a little bit of shelter for the birds as well. So I try and leave all of my dead plant material up and tidy it up just a little and leave it there until spring, until I know the growth is coming back and we'll be around to support birds again. And some of our unsung heroes for the birds are the grasses. For grassland birds, they provide nest sites. Again, they're insect species that use them. And then the seed heads are good for birds and the dry grass is good for nesting material. So there are a lot more plants other than this, but I thought I'd give you some of my top picks just to get you started. Not only do we have to consider the individual plants, but also the kind of habitat we want to create for the birds. For woodland birds especially, they're used to multi-level habitats. Leaf litter at the ground level, herbaceous plants just above that, shrubs, small trees, and then the overhead canopy. And if you're looking at this and thinking, well, I can't do that in my tiny yard, I have a very good friend in Detroit who has a postage stamp size yard and she has managed this wonderfully in just this tiny space. You don't need to have a forest. Birds will understand the levels no matter what you do. So within that level, you want to maintain some leaf litter. A lot of invertebrates and insects will hide in that space. So your thrushes, grackles, um, some of your warbler species will find those food items there when they're migrating and also those that stick around for the winter. If you can, providing brush piles gives shelter and again, place for to, uh, birds to find insects. Wrens love brush piles. 
but you have to be careful of your city ordinances and of course, be respectful of your neighbors. And if at all possible, if you have a tree that dies, try to maintain at least the trunk. I had a big box elder in my former yard. We cut off all the branches and left about 12 feet and it became a home initially for a pair of flickers who quickly got displaced by a pair of starlings, unfortunately. But even if you don't have a dead tree, you can borrow somebody else's, cut it down, sink it into the ground, make sure it is secured. And that way, if it's just the trunk part, you won't have branches in the upper part of the tree that might damage your house or fall on somebody. So all of these different elements can be combined. Um, the plants, the coarse woody debris, which is very important as Cornell Lab of Ornithology has done through many studies, they found out that this way of constructing habitat is very attractive to beneficial and supportive of birds. So we can mimic that even in our urban environment. All right, so now if you want to bring birds over to your area, it's really important to consider some protective measures. Um, number one, we got to talk about cats. Uh, if you look at this graph over here on the right, um, this crazy tall line, way taller than any of the others, is the amount of birds killed by cats in North America. Um, and so you can see we have cats first, and then we have buildings, windows, automobiles, on, on from there, but you can see that cats have a huge, huge impact. Um, so a couple notes just to remember, um, cats do not only hunt when they are hungry, they will also hunt just to play and because it's their natural instinct. And so keeping a cat fed, even if it's outside, isn't going to protect the birds. Um, in addition to that, we have to be considerate of the fledglings that we have in the spring and summer. So those are the little birds uh, the young ones who have jumped out of the nest, but they are not quite flying yet. They are super easy pickings for a cat to grab, even if that cat has a little bell or one of those little cat bibs on. Um, unfortunately, cats are just really good hunters and uh, they can outsmart all of our little tricks. Um, I, I would agree that I think it would be really nice to be a cat and live outside, be able to explore, but they do live much longer if you keep them inside. And I believe that it's just not the harm on the, or not worth the harm on the environment to let your cat outside. So if you get a new cat, please consider keeping it inside. Um, next. Uh, next, we have bird safe windows. So birds do not see windows the same way that we do. Um, they will see the reflection in the window or they will actually just see straight through the window, uh, especially if you have house plants or something and they will think that they can fly through. Um, so we have a lot of birds that are actually crashing into buildings and they either uh, die upon impact or they will fly away and die later on, um, which is why we don't find tons of birds. Um, also many birds hit these windows when they're migrating at night and then little scavengers like rats and cats and raccoons will pick them up. And so that's another reason why we're not finding a ton of these birds, but it is definitely happening. Uh, windows are having a big effect, including residential windows. Um, sometimes we're led to believe that only the really big buildings and the skyscrapers are causing the issues, but all of our homes are causing issues too. So if you found that you have a window that birds are crashing into, there's a couple measures that you can take. Um, so I have a couple ones listed here. You can easily just use paint or soap. You just have to make sure that your lines are spaced closely together. Um, I also have an example of Kaleidoscape at the left. It looks really opaque from the outside, but from the inside, you can't even notice it. Um, then I have the Acopian bird savers, which are um, very nice and not noticeable. Um, also very easy to install. And then last over here on the right, 
I have feather friendly dots and these dots are at the Belle Isle Nature Center. Um, actually over at the Detroit Zoo, they have a ton of awesome examples of bird safe windows. Um, on their amphibian house, their lion exhibit, their, their penguin exhibit. Um, they're all over and you wouldn't notice them unless you're looking for them and they are, they look good. Um, they don't cause any issues with like being able to see inside or the animals. So um, yeah, just be thoughtful if you have a problem window in your house. Uh, then we have the issue of light pollution. Uh, so like I kind of mentioned before, um, almost, well, many birds migrate at night. Um, these night migrants usually use the light from the stars and the moon to orient themselves. And so the really bright lights that come off of buildings are extremely disorienting to them, uh, a little bit in like a similar way of how like bugs or moths are attracted to light at night. Um, so when the birds are kind of sucked into this light, sometimes they will just fly circles around the building until they die of exhaustion or they will end up crashing into the building. Um, so it's very sad, not really talked about, but it's something that we do need to talk about more. Um, over on the right, I have a couple examples of some light fixtures that help to direct your light. So it's just going where you need it, not causing extra glow up into the air around you. Um, you know, light is important for safety, but we just want to be direct with where we're using it. Uh, and then last, um, we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier um, that almost all birds feed their babies insects or bugs. Um, so all the birds that come to your bird feeder in the winter and take seeds, they still need bugs in the summer to feed their babies. The bugs have the proper protein and nutrients that the babies need to survive. Um, and those babies need to be fed every hour, every half hour. So they need a lot of bugs to eat. So pesticides, can't use them. Herbicides and fertilizers can also have chemicals that can harm the birds, kill the insects that they need. So these are just not an option if you're trying to bring birds to your yard. Um, this is the Urban Bird Treaty Program, um, and Detroit uh, joined this group in 2017. Um, it is a group that works together to talk about best practices for conserving urban bird habitats, um, talking to people about birds in urban areas, and reducing um, the common hazards that urban birds face. There are now 30 urban bird treaty cities in the USA. Uh, and this is the Detroit Bird City program. Um, this is one of the main programs that I work on. Uh, we partner with the city of Detroit and many uh, neighborhood groups uh, to create native flower meadows on spaces within the city that are not being used. Um, so this is a great way to beautify the area for neighbors um, while also providing really essential habitat and resources for pollinators, grassland birds, migratory birds, um, all of those guys. We go through a lot of community engagement before we begin restoration. Um, and then we work with the community to pick out some sections for signs and benches that make everything look really nice and intentional, um, just to be sure that uh, everybody knows that the space is being maintained and it has, you know, these tall flowers and grasses for a reason. Oh, and then in addition, never mind. 
Okay, I was going to add, uh, we do have some volunteer programs coming up um, that we'll be sending information on. Um, and I kind of, I coordinate those. And so I'm always trying to push for more volunteers. And if you guys are wondering why we're having these sound difficulties, it's because Brittany and I are in the same room. And so our computers are trying to talk to each other. Um, hence why we both have bright yellow walls in the background. <laughs> uh, so I'm really sorry about those technical difficulties and I will mute myself now and i'm going to unmute myself i am not there with ava and Brittany, so i don't have any sound background problems here so it's michelle back on again and as we mentioned at the beginning of the program i am a volunteer at wayne state university in the safe passage program through detroit audubon and what this is is a monitoring program where we go around and study different buildings to see what kind of bird injuries are occurring at those buildings. I've been doing this for the last three years on campus and entering my data into the Global Bird Collision Mapper. You can see on the right, this is data from last year. So I can see where some hot spots are on campus. I average about 50 birds each migratory season, spring and fall every year. These are birds that are either deceased or injured um, in some way. And the number one bird that I get on campus, which is pretty depressing for me, are the warblers. Uh, sometimes the only way I get to see them. And oven birds are my number one warbler strike. They comprise up to 20% of my birds in some seasons, followed closely by sparrows, mostly white-throated sparrows and the rushes. But knowing this, has allowed us now to go ahead and plan with Wayne State University where we're going to start mitigating these bird window strikes. We have a new sustainability plan and built into the plan is a way to reduce this from happening on campus so that we can be a safer area for birds because we are a green space that they are attracted to. So we want to make sure that while they're coming to make use of that green space that these birds are safe. So this is a program that you can become involved in as well. Um, you can contact Detroit Audubon for more details, but I'm always looking for some help on campus if you're in the area. I'll probably start walking my regular route in mid-March and that goes on until mid-June and then again in the fall for fall migration. So as we're coming to the end of our program, we wanna make sure that you have resources available to you to help you plan how you're going to help urban birds in your area, either in your yard, your business, your industry, wherever that happens to be. And my number one go-to is a book. Yes, I still use books. Websites are great, but books have everything in one place. And Birdscaping in the Midwest is not only a great resource for landscaping and choosing plants, that are specific to various bird species that you'll find in your area, but there are also garden designs, how to incorporate water, what plants benefit insects, and details about the individual plants and where you can find them. So it's a great one-stop shopping guide to using native plants to support birds and creating gardens, even container gardens that can help urban birds. As I mentioned earlier, Doug Talamy, he's an entomologist who has become very influential in supporting native plants to support insects, to support birds. And he's got a new program called Two Thirds for the Birds. And it's about having two thirds or up to 70% of your plants in your yard um, as native plants. If you have that quantity of natives, so you can still keep a few of your favorite non-natives, but if two thirds of your plants are natives, they will support our native birds. And that's great too, because then the non-native birds that Ava mentioned earlier, they aren't as apt to use those plants. So this is giving them a, a boost, providing those resources to reduce the competitive stresses that they have and that they experience. Again, if you wanna learn about these birds, Cornell's All About Birds is a great site to go to. There are many others but Cornell Lab of Ornithology is the most scientifically based. And that's where a lot of other places get their information. If you're wondering what kind of plants to use for your area, Audubon has a great database. You type in your zip code and you'll get a list of plants, native plants that are endemic to your region. 
So we also are going to send this to you. You're going to have access to these links. We are having, we do have some webinars that you can watch um, to get more information. And this one will be posted as well. So you can always check back on those if you want more in-depth information about using native plants um, for birds, specifically for insects to promote birds, and then just making a space bird friendly and where you can get native plants in the area. So here we have a wide range of field trips or program options. And so as Michelle mentioned earlier in the presentation, we actually have two of our field trips that we actually created to tie into this webinar. And that is uh, their two separate birding field trips on Wayne State campus. And so say you do, you do live close. So unfortunately, if you live over in Maryland, you won't probably be able to attend, but that's okay. Because with this, we're gonna have two separate, one for students and teachers, just to kind of get that younger age range more involved and interested in this, if you're not already interested. Um, but also we'll have a second one on May 15th that is open to the general public. And so we'll walk around Wayne State campus, point out those lovely hot spots that we lightly touched on, but we have a full map that will be prepared. Um, outside of that, two topics that we've actually mentioned in this presentation that we actually have webinars coming up that we'll delve into a lot more is the Michigan Dark Skies program, which will be on April 21st, and a Trees Are For the Birds webinar on May 10th. And so both of those will really go into a deeper range of information on what you would need to know for those topics. Um, Michelle mentioned previously that there were a couple of presentations that we've already offered in the past that touch on other things within this presentation. Um, when it comes to how you can help birds, there's just enormous amounts of things you can do. And so within an hour, we can't possibly talk about everything. Um, something else you can do that always helps the birds, not only in your yard, but is to help us at these volunteer events. And so we have two listed here, one on March 12th coming up real soon at Callahan Park, um, and then another one on May 28th. We'll have others as well as they come up, but those are two that are verified and you can register. Um, and those are always helpful because as we continue to restore parks through the Detroit Bird City Project, it's really important that we have volunteers to help us because we can't possibly do it all on our own. And so we offer these volunteer events, one, because it's a way to teach our volunteers about what they could possibly do at home, but it helps to restore areas in our local neighborhoods and communities for these birds. So that way other people, besides just those that know about them already, but other people, the chance to see these birds as well. Um, I listed a few other upcoming field trips, but if you go to our DetroitAudubon.org or our Facebook page, I do list other field trip options and program opportunities um, on our web pages. So we'd love for you to attend future opportunities. Um, and from here, we will go ahead and open up to questions. So before we get into that, I will lightly say, so for those of you, this is a free program. Our webinars are always free. Um, if you're not already a member, we do love whenever we get new members. It's only about $30 a year, but you get a full year, which is four Flyway magazines. You get program discounts. So for those of field trips that we do charge a small fee, um, you get discounted rates compared to the general public. And then um, in some other regards, we do offer earlier opportunities to register. Um, and you don't have to be a member, but we also have our Flyway Express uh, newsletter. And so if you send us your email, we will be able to send you that. Usually that's bi-weekly and we'll let you know what programs are coming up. So uh, we would love for you to be either a member or even a non-member. You don't have to be a member to be able to enjoy some of our benefits. But from here, we will open up to questions. I did see we had some questions that were addressed earlier. Thank you, Michelle, for answering them. Uh, let's see. So the first um, I'll go ahead and I'll read some of the questions out of chat just um, just to be able to, for those of you that maybe you didn't read them or uh, you missed it, maybe um, 
One person says, I noticed, I have noticed a change in bird population has changed. Used to have hundreds of birds, too many to count. This year, a few cardinals, crows, etc. There's not really a question involved with that. Um, but the next uh, comment was, is the Northern Oriole the same as the Baltimore Oriole? Michelle says, yes, Rob, thanks for the correction. So there are two different types of Orioles, um, but yes, thank you for asking that lovely question. Um, let's see. Someone, Rob also said, I planted a red oak in my suburban backyard. We love oaks. I know I have a pin oak in my yard and I actually just planted a white oak in my yard as well that I'm excited to grow. Um, but yeah, so let's see. It is, it is true that it is beneficial to leave a tree that has been attacked by a woodpecker. Um, Michelle says, yes, they are finding insects under the bark and possibly constructing nest cavities that they can use and other birds would be able to use after the woodpeckers abandon them. So not all birds use the nest cavities this year after year. So it is, a, it is common for birds to bounce around to different locations, um, but it, you also may find some species that do nest in the same spot every year. It really depends on the species. Um, Michelle also commented, she says, it will start to rot and get soft and punky after a while, but then you can lay it down as a log and it can keep providing habitat. So once you lay those uh, rotted out logs down, salamanders and other species as well as insects will go in there and other birds will still go after that for food resources. So um, it's not, even once it's more decayed, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't keep using it for resources. So. Um, if anyone had any other questions, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask it directly. Um, outside of that, you can still feel free to add it into the comments uh, so we can read it out to the group. Um, hi, this is Anne. I'm wondering if you have any good recommendations on how to clean up like uh, yard waste, like from um, like from the, the sunflower seed holes and things like that. Yeah, Michelle, did you want to answer that question? She was asking about the best ways to do right. cleanup in the spring. Um, if it's sunflower seeds from a feeder, I keep those clean as much as possible as time goes along, and I will put them in a corner of my yard to compost. Um, they can be somewhat toxic to other plants in mass, but worms really like sunflower seed shell compost. So I'll keep it away from where I want plants because um, it will damage some and suppress the growth of some plants. If it's sunflower seeds from the plants themselves, um, I don't know about anybody else, but the squirrels tend to get my sunflower heads way before they produce any mass of seeds. So uh, I haven't had that problem with the actual plants. Some of the plants that I mentioned, the birds will get in there and scatter the seeds as they go for their food items. So you may get what we call volunteer plants coming up. Um, if you find them early enough, you can just pluck them. I usually dig them up, pot them up and give them away to friends or use them on campus projects. So that's a few things that happen with seeds. And I hope I addressed your question, Anne. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? All right, I'm not seeing anything so far. So thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, if you come up with questions later that you would like us to address or answer for you, you are always welcome to email us. Um, if you wanna get in contact with Michelle at any point in regards to maybe some questions or maybe even volunteering to help out around Wayne campus to help monitor some of the Safe Passage program, uh, you can reach out to us directly at staff at detroitaudubon.org and we will relay that information and connect you to her if needed. Um, if you wanna learn more about other programs, again, feel free to check out our detroitaudubon.org or again, contacting us at staff at detroitaudubon.org. Um, we love questions. We love being able to connect with the public, answering questions and 
really helping you find a way to help nature in a way that maybe you haven't been able to before and in simple ways that um, maybe you can't think of. And so that's what we're here for is to help bridge that connection. And so again, thank you everybody. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, very soon. And again, we hope to see you over in April will be the Michigan Dark Skies and Bird Migration webinar. So have a good evening and good night. <laughs>